Thank you. Somebody told me to stand here. I'm not sure why. Um, <laughs> but I, I usually do what I'm, what I'm told when I'm a guest, um, especially an ally. Um, wow. Uh, it's tremendous to be speaking and to be invited to participate at the first national LGBT history festival. Um, one of the things that um, Sue um, was asked, and I do wherever I travel, is asked to talk to schools. Um, and the first thing that I do normally when I'm addressing students is talk about living history. What an amazing time we are in right now. Just amazing. Many LGBT leaders are discussing how current history will be written. So there's a bit debate going on right now kind of quietly, although it's leaked out a little bit behind closed doors, from LGBT leaders of who is the Rosa Parks of the LGBT movement? Who has moved the needle on <coughs> issues like gay marriage? Who has gotten us so far so fast? Now, there's a lot of people who position themselves. There's a lot of books that have come out on the marriage equality <laughs> movement. Um, I always say the fact of the matter is it's the everyday person who follows my uncle's message of living an open and out life. It is the young kid who's having a kitchen table conversation with their parents that's to this day, regardless of how accepting an environment we create, is still uncomfortable. It is the, the, the ally in a schoolyard playground who stands up against xenophobia when someone from another country and another culture is being attacked. It is the individuals who spend their time and energy working to economically build up a community to make sure that no one is suffering and using the intersectionality of all minority groups. Connecting those dots. The LGBT movement did not get here by ourselves and it was not one person, it was not it, was, it, was, it, it, it is the individuals who live an open life. Now let me just take you, since I got some time, to the a pending decision that we have that's record shattering for us in the, in the states, which is a pending Supreme Court decision. Well, two justices have already said that the defining difference on that Supreme Court is that all of the justices know LGBT people. That was, not the, that was not the case in the 1970s when my uncle was running for office. So in the 1970s when he was running for office, his message of come out, come out was really shattering. He was, by the way, historians need to always correct me and correct people who say he was the first openly gay elected official in the United States. He was not. He was certainly the first loud, out, and proud one. We had two before who simply said, yes, I'm gay. There's no reason to talk about it. Harvey talked about it constantly. Harvey was the first person who went to trade unionists and said, let's make a deal. We'll help you, you help us. He was the first person in, uh, in California that said, let's form a statewide campaign, not just a local campaign. He built coalitions with women, with, um, uh, with, for the very first time with the uh, Asian community in San Francisco. Um, he realized that for us to get progress, when we represent three, five percent of the population, we can't do it unless we connect with other minority groups. So it was with particular pleasure last year when the cover of the Washington Post, when the polls finally changed on marriage equality and the majority of Americans believed that marriage equality is, a, is an important right that should be given, it was from Harvey Milk to 58%. That was the cover. Because it was really my uncle's message. Now, for those of you who've seen the movie Milk, um, uh, it was not Hollywood in terms of that tape-recorded will. My uncle knew that he was going to be killed. He didn't know who, and he didn't know it would be Dan White. Um, Ann Cronenberg, who is his campaign manager, is the co-founder of the Harvey Milk Foundation with me. We keep the actual written death threats that he got. Now, you have to realize, when he was running for public office, and this is an ancient history, at least I don't think so, because I'm still alive, <laughs> and I was alive then. Um, uh, when he was running for public office, when he began, it was criminal to be gay, um, and it was considered a severe mental illness by the American Psychological and Psych uh, American Psychiatric Association. 
And so here's this person talking about, I'm here to recruit you. And that was Anita Bryant's line. So those of you who know history, the, 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 um, the great um, former Miss America and orange juice queen, I mean, she used, she said, well, who are, who's, who's recruiting your children? The gays are. So my uncle taught us a great lesson, use their semantics. So his, I'm here to recruit you, is to take away the power of that. So he did begin his speeches, I'm here to recruit you, I'm here to recruit you for justice, I'm here to recruit you for equality, I'm here to recruit you to defend the US Constitution and constitutions all over the world. Very, very important. But those death threats, amazingly, most of them were not anonymous. In fact, we have, um, a, uh, we have a written note um, from the sheriff of Orange County, which is kind of similar to your police chief, that says, Harvey, you step into Orange County, California, my deputies will put bullets into your head. So he didn't know who was going to kill him, and he didn't know when, but he knew it was gonna happen. And he thought, he actually, to be honest with you, 11 months was more than he thought he was gonna get. That's what he had in office, 11 months. Um, we have two letters from Harvey, uh, a, a whole bunch of phone calls, but two letters where he thought they would be the last letters to me and my brother. Um, and in those letters, he talked about what his life hopefully means. And so um, the one thing that the Sean Penn movie, I think, accurately showed is his contemplation um, and his desire to be, to put himself at risk to go so far as to not just simply say I'm gay, but to proclaim that it is good, that it is within the framework of humanity, and that we are connected to everyone else that struggled, no less and no greater. And so um, I'm often asked if I feel bad that my uncle did not get to see a day like today. We're here in Birmingham, I'm sorry, in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> My mind is on Alabama, and I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> um, so I, I apologize. But we're here in Manchester at an LGBT history conference with people like Peter, iconic individuals that you have living history. By the way, take oral histories on all these people. Someone pull Peter aside. Make sure you get an oral history from him. Um, he, he, you know, he would not be surprised at where we are. He wouldn't even be surprised at marriage equality. Um, why do I say that? Because what gave him the strength to go to work every day, to continue doing what he was doing, to go into churches where everyone hated him, and go in and talk to them, and try to convince them, and try to change their mind, the reason that he would do all these things is because he dreamed of today. He did see today. He dreamed of it. Therefore, he saw it. Therefore, there's no regrets. Um, now, I just mentioned Birmingham, and I have to go to Alabama, because we're actually in, in this very interesting historical moment um, for historians to look at in terms of a state Supreme Court judge that's actually now challenging the US Supreme Court. Um, so I don't know if many of you know what's happening in the states, but we have uh, a pending US Supreme Court decision I, it's, 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 I would, I, you know, people would probably do better luck betting on horses on how the Supreme Court will vote on something, but I think we're pretty good at this one. It looks like likely not just to be a 5-4 four, five, uh, five, decision, but it may be a 7-2 to two decision um, uh, in favor of marriage equality through all 50 states. Right now, 70% of Americans are covered with marriage equality. But we have somebody in Alabama who is so fundamentally opposed to LGBT rights that the, that the Supreme Court of Alabama, the Chief Justice, is ordering clerks not to marry LGBT couples, even though the federal government, via a federal court, has said, you must begin. They appealed to the Supreme Court, and the appeal was that you're going to rule in June, at least stay that marriages until June because it would do terrible harm to Alabama if we allowed any gay people to marry. And the Supreme Court said, no, we're not going to stay it. There's no harm. The marriages can continue. Of course, there were two justices who agreed with the, 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 with the judge. Um, so we are in this historic, historic time. And the interesting thing is that our African-American community in the United States are drawing the parallel to another 
figure in Alabama, a governor named George Wallace, who refused, even though the federal government said integrate schools. We are in living history, living history. It's, it's, it's really quite amazing. We, we have 17 countries where LGBT people can marry, and we have many places where we have to backfill. And when I say we have to backfill, old activists like me, um, and some who are a little bit older than me who might be in this room, um, we all actually said that we have to get LGBT non-discrimination, we have to have protections, marriage equality will come. In reality, when I was young, I didn't even ma imagine being able to marry my same-sex partner. I simply wanted to be left alone and to allow myself to be celebrated within my family. The change happened when young people said, the bar is too low. The bar is too low. We want marriage, and we don't want tolerance. We want celebration. And so when my friend Gavin Newsom in San Francisco in 2004 decided, without any laws on his side, without any um, backing from the legal community, decided to begin marrying people in San Francisco. And if you ask Gavin why he did that, he's now our lieutenant governor in California, he'll tell you because young people came in and they said, we want marriage. They set that bar high. So if, if, there's, if there's a Rosa Parks of our time, it is all of the people who have gotten married and all the people who demanded marriage and all the people who travel the world talking about equality. We have literally, luckily, hundreds of thousands of Rosa Parks. Um, that has been the change. And the interesting correlation to my uncle and marriage equality is that when people do get married, even if they were not tremendously out, they become very out because you don't go to a marriage tolerance ceremony. <laughs> you go to a celebration and you really enjoy yourself and you put your same sex partner's picture on your desk at work. Um, it's a game changer and it hits at the very heart of the key arguments that have been used against the LGBT community. It, 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 in fact, what we have seen, at least in the states, um, we have seen religious communities left and right becoming open and affirming. Religious communities that were dead set against the inclusion of LGBT people are now recruiting LGBT people. And I'll tell you one brief story. I was in Havana last April, um, and there was a Baptist group from South Carolina working with a, um, with, a, with, a, with a gay minister in Cuba. And he said to me, Stuart, how do I recruit gay people? We're trying to, and we can't find them in South Carolina. And we hooked them up. But that is, that is the change. So faith communities are starting to see that they were on the wrong side of history and getting on, on the right side of history. And I don't believe in beating up people who change. Um, the, probably the biggest mover of uh, American LGBT rights has been someone that I campaigned long and hard for, President Barack Obama, who has always put LGBT people on the big C civil rights. Now, there's an interesting book that came out by one of his senior advisors who said that he was always passionate and completely in favor of get marriage equality. And for a political expediency, he said that he was on the fence and that he's so. And the president has just corrected him and said, no, 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 I really was evolving. Um, doesn't matter. Um, uh, it got us to where we are today. When the president put out a presidential memorandum that said, Every single US government agency that operates abroad must support LGBT rights. That was life changing for someone like me who spends so much time overseas. Now, let me, let me just say that as much as we have this historic, wonderful movement forward, we also have some historical movements backwards. And that's why it's important to remember history. I spend a lot of time in Central and Eastern Europe. And let me tell you that um, there's a lot that actually feels a lot like the 1930s. Um, uh, how much time do I have? You've got another 15 minutes. OK. So um, some of you may know um, uh, the story of Milan Rosa. Um, uh, Milan Rosa was, some, was a young 20-year-old who um, uh, I was, I, there's an interesting last 
um, television interview of my uncle, uh, which was about the Briggs Initiative, which was a, a Proposition 6. It was an initiative that would have banned people from teaching um, who were LGBT or supportive of LGBT people. It wasn't just LGBT, by the way. And, um, and he got that defeated, and that was four weeks before he was killed. Two weeks before that was defeated, he was on TV, and this reporter said, you know, people, say, people said to me, Harvey, we shouldn't have you on. It's a great uh, YouTube clip, so if you Google Juana and Harvey Milk, you'll get to see the whole thing. She said, people said we shouldn't have you on because you don't speak for the whole LGBT community. He said, no, I don't speak for the whole LGBT community. No one does, because we're everywhere, and we represent everyone. And she said, well, you know, people, people we tried to get, and she started naming people that she tried to get. And he said, I know, you couldn't get anyone else, so you have me. So let's talk about the issues. And, um, and that's when the Harvey Milk Foundation usually calls, when they can't get anyone else. Um, and I actually like that correlation to my uncle. It's like, you know, well, who can we get? We've called everyone. Well, there's that nephew of Harvey Milk and, and his campaign manager who, who goes around the country. So in Budapest, for in 2010, after a very violent pride in 2009, um, former Soviet satellite that actually was the first to have pride, um, the Jobbik party was in full swing, um, a neo-Nazi party, ultra-right wing, and a center-right government. And, um, and, it, there was the, and they asked me to come, and I arrived, and there were 5,000 counter-demonstrators, and there were about 300 marchers, about 150 from Western Europe, and maybe 150 um, Hungarians. But they gave me a bullhorn, <laughs> and they gave me, they put the TV cameras in front of me, and I don't speak Hungarian. So I said, is there anyone who, who's willing to talk? And so this young 20-year-old named Milan Rosas said, I will. And he took that bullhorn, and he was eloquent, and he was a student of my uncle, and he really felt like that gave him some deep connection to Harvey, and it did. Um, and he did this wonderful job going down on Dronsky Boulevard. Um, chilling scene. I've been to places where I've had lots of things thrown at me, and I've faced off some pretty scary sights, but the silence in Hungary is almost deafening. I mean, it was walking down that street, nobody waved back. Doors close, balconies close, businesses shutter as you go by. Just absolutely frightening. Um, I went on to Brussels and, um, and uh, I got a phone call the next day that Milan had gone home to his house and opened his door and his father was hanging. Now Milan was out to his father um, and had a good relationship with them, but in Hungary you don't it's kind of like going back to the 1970s in the States. You just do not talk about being gay. You don't do it publicly. If you're going to live, you kind of get that nod and it's okay from your family, but let's not talk about it. And so he was devastated, 20-year-old. I was Skyping with him the whole week. And then, again, another city in crisis. Um, Prague decides to ha has planned their first pride. So the Czech Republic was going to be the last Soviet former republic to have a pride. And President Klaus, as many of you may know, asked people to rise up and stop the pride. He called it debauchery. So they asked me to come in. They picked me up at the airport. And, um, and as I was, um, as we were driving into uh, Prague, they said, you know, we didn't have a street long rainbow flag. And if anyone's been to a pride, that's a must. And we're very clever, so sometimes we do it to make the pride seem much larger than it really is. But we, you must have a street long rainbow flag. So they put out an urgent call and they said, well, we've got to go to the bus station because there's a kid who's taking off from work and taking an eight-hour bus ride to bring us that flag. And the bus door opens and it's Milan. He had just buried his father the day before. And I looked at him and I started to tear up. And, um, and he said to me, let's not cry today. Today we're going to support the Czech people. And, he, and I brought him on stage. And actually, that pride was, was quite successful in compared, comparison to Budapest. And he went on, and I've got, the, Sue has seen my slideshow, uh, Milan continued to work, not just the LGBT community and be a major voice there, but he worked to support Roma, and he walked to support uh, immigrants, and he worked to support the Jewish community, and he worked to support women's um, issues. And he was an LGBT face in all the intersectionality that we need to do. 
and we work with him on how to relate and how to get people to support the LGBT. And even when these communities were not going to support him back, he still went out there and supported. He put an LGBT face, for instance, on when the Danube started to overflow. He got as many visible or willing to be visible LGBT to be out there and be on TV putting up sandbags. He put an LGBT face on the civil society movement. And I brought him to the White House in 2013 because I wanted him to talk to Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid and the President and the First Lady about what's going on in Hungary and give them a vision and also be able to take back their message. And the day before he left for the White House, and some of you may know this in 2013, the Secretary of the Hungarian Parliament got up and said, Anyone of Jewish history, anyone of Jewish ancestry is an enemy of the state. We need to know where they live and where they work. Now, let me tell you, the first voice in Hungary against that statement was someone who has no Jewish ancestry and didn't know many Jewish people until we started working with him. Milan Rosa got on TV and said, this is wrong. It, wasn't a, it was a week later that the prime minister actually moved back from that statement and said he doesn't quite agree with it. And this is what's going on there. Now, Unfortunately, the Milan story had a very happy um, conclusion that he is um, a Harvey Milk that we see replicated in young people all around the world. Milan's allowed me to tell his story. Most of the young people that we work with, it's too dangerous for me to tell their story. And I always respect, and some that we've lost but didn't want me to tell their story. But unfortunately, this November, um, and it's still under investigation, but Milan was either thrown or the police are considering that he jumped in front of a train. So, um, so we've lost Milan. But one of the amazing things was is the um, most incredible response to violence that I think the world had ever seen in the 1970s was this candlelight spontaneous vigil to my uncle's assassination when 40,000 people got into the streets of San Francisco, walked to City Hall in silence. And people replicated that in Budapest. And we did it again in Sporin, where Milan had his funeral. So we have today living history. We have people who have taken on um, my uncle's call, who have stood on his shoulders and created shoulders for the next generation. We have tremendous young people that are struggling where we're going backwards. Uh, 18 months ago, one-sixth of the world's population lived, one-sixth of the world's population today are recriminalized where they were decriminalized, LGBT people, 18 months ago when India's Supreme Court recriminalized it. We can't forget the whole world that's east of Istanbul. We have young leaders that we're supporting in the Middle East against tremendous, tremendous odds. And 75% of the world's population is east of Istanbul. We, 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 so our progress, as historic and wonderful as it is, we must move it forward. So I'm going to just close with two quotes. Um, the reason I do global work, because I get asked that frequently, is because in 1985, um, I got to go to the closing conference on the UN Decade of Women. I was 25 years old. I was working on the Equal Rights Amendment. Someone asked me why I was doing that instead of gay rights, and I'll tell you that it's a longer story. But, um, <laughs> um, and I got to go to Nairobi, Kenya, and, I'm, and it was my first time overseas. I was 25 years old, and I get to Nairobi, and most people look like me. Most people were this color. And so, um, and there was this room of thousands of people. It was buzzing, and the conference began with someone who's become a good friend of mine a little aboriginal leader named Lilla Watson. And she got up at this conference and she said, look, if you have come here because you want to help me, if you've come here because you want to help women, come here because you want to help minorities, go home. We have nothing to talk about. That buzz became absolutely still silent. You could hear a pin drop in that room. And she said, let me repeat myself. If you have come here because you want to help me, go home. We have nothing to talk about. But if you have come here because you understand that your liberation is bound with mine, then let us work together. To me, one of the most brilliant statements that have ever been made. 
Why? Because we should be telling people that they shouldn't just be supporting the liberation of everyone because it's the right thing. They should be doing it because it's in all of our self-interest. It's a great motivator. She knew that. Um, tremendous, tremendous impact on me as a 25-year-old. I then believed that there was no place safe for me when, when everybody who was LGBT or who was a minority was at risk anywhere in the world. And I had the, I have the honor of having had a dialogue with Lilla now um, uh, for, for, for a couple decades. Um, and she's a very, very humble person, so for those of you who are going to go and Google her <laughs> or look at her Wikipedia page, you know, she's an Aboriginal leader and she refuses, she wrote that, but she refuses to take credit for it. She says, I'm not the author of it because her Aboriginal tribe does not believe that anyone creates anything that belongs to an individual, that it belongs to the collective. So she said that is, belongs to her whole Aboriginal tribe. Um, and then I just want to, 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 to tell you a little bit of my living history because we've lost some amazing people recently. Um, uh, my first experience at a memorial for my uncle, and Su Sue's the, the reason I'm telling this story because she, I thought that she had told me that she had a, a, a relationship with someone who, who, who's, who's a bigger than life, amazing um, poet and artist and singer and actress. Um, and someone who kind of held me in their hands um, a year after my uncle was killed. So the first memorial, I was in Washington, D.C. Um, I was a student at American University, and it was the first memorial for my uncle, and I couldn't go out to San Francisco. And there was a bookstore in Washington, Lambda Rising, which uh, we're losing a lot of our LGBT bookstores. <laughs> it's gone. Um, but outside that bookstore was going to be the vigil for my uncle. And the AME churches, which are black African-American churches, did a protest there. And they outnumbered those of us in the memorial three to one. And it was the typical protest that you saw in America. Well, they weren't terribly violent. They just repent or perish. You're going to go to hell. You know, the whole thing that we kept seeing. And, um, and as I was walking in, a, a woman taller than me um, <laughs> was walking in. And, um, and she said, are you going to the memorial? And I said, yes. And she said, well, I'm Dr. Maya Angelou. And who are you? And I said, I said, well, I'm Stuart Milk. And she said, oh, are you related? I said, I'm, I'm the nephew. And she looked at these protesters. Now, on the spot, without forethought, without any planning, she turned. And she turned to those protesters and she said, in this big, booming voice, voice without a microphone, she said, I am gay. I am straight. I am black. I am white, I am Native American, I am human. And she eyeballed all of them. And they dispersed. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great festival.